This is the 34th lecture of the course MTH204A for section B. We call that in the last lecture we are talking about integral dependence. Suppose A and B are commutative rings, then an element alpha in B is said to be integral over A. If there is a monic polynomial with coefficients over with coefficients from A which has alpha as a root. Okay. So, we also gave some examples. Let me recall that for you. So, let us take A equal to Z and B equal to C or any subring of C because any subring of C automatically includes uh, Z aut automatically contains Z. Then, uh, then, uh, then uh, first of all any integer is trivially any integer is trivially integral over Z. Then uh, we have this elements root 2, root 3, root or in general any nth root of uh, m and then also we have uh, i or any uh, nth root of unity. So, all these are the examples of elements integral over z, into examples of numbers which are integral over z. In fact, as I have already said that for our purpose it will be enough if we stick to, if we stick to z only. Uh, for our purpose it will it will be enough if we consider a to be z and b to be uh, any sub, a b to be whole of c or any sub any subring of uh, c and the complex numbers which are integral over integral over uh, z they are called algebraic integers algebraic integers uh, okay, so uh, but of course, whatever we will be we will be discussing here that holds for any in the any general set in the general setting of any uh, arbitrary extension of rings. Uh, okay, so here the as I said the standard examples of uh, algebraic integers are any integer or this uh, or this uh, surds or this nth root of unity. Okay. So, it is very natural to ask at this point is uh, what about like uh, any integer and algebraic integer. So, what about rational numbers can they be algebraic integers? We will show that that is not actual uh, not uh, the case. So, in fact, we will be proving this more general theorem. Though uh, as I said that though it will for our purpose it will be enough to stick to uh, uh, stick to the ring of uh, stick to this uh, uh, the uh, this ring of our uh, integers namely the z but however whatever we are doing whatever we will be doing that uh, most of them holds for any arbitrary uh, re extension of uh, commutative rings as well so let me prove this in the generality as well let uh, a be an integral a be an integral domain and uh, if b its field of fractions of fractions if uh, alpha belonging to f is integral over a integral over a then alpha must be from A. So, that, that the, it clearly says that inside its field of fractions the only elements which are integral over A are the elements from A itself. In terms of algebraic integers as a consequence of this general theorem we see that no rational number is going to be an algebraic integer unless it is a integer. Okay. So, the proof of this is actually quite easy how to prove that. So, so alpha is a, so therefore, alpha will satisfy some uh, equation like this. Okay. And each a i h e a i a i belongs to a and r since alpha is in f. So, alpha must be of this form r by s where uh, we can uh, we can assume that we can assume that R and S are co prime. 
So, their GCD, what it means is maybe I should write the R and S coprime. because both have factorizations in terms of irreducibles and the irreducible factors which are associate, we can cancel them out. Therefore, uh, that is what we have obtained in a very reduced form, where one does not have any common irreducible factor between R and S. Now, putting R and S there and multiplying both sides, what we obtain is uh, R to the power n plus a n minus 1, uh, R to the power n minus 1 S and that is how it goes a 1 r s to the power n minus uh, 1 plus a naught equal to times s to the power n equals to 0. Okay. Now, uh, uh, let p be, let p be, so what do we want? We want s to be a unit. So, if it is not a unit then of course, it is non-zero, if it is not a unit then it will have a it will admit an irreducible divisor. So, let be any irreducible dividing S. Yes. So, you see that that irreducible will divide this entire thing and of course, that irreducible divides 0 as well. So, therefore, this will force P will divide R to the power n. Now, in an UF, uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay, fine. I should uh, I should have rather taken in a UFD uh, UFD. So yeah. So throughout uh, this irreducibles, everything they they are co-prime. All these things uh, they are uh, they make sense. Uh, like yeah. So what I'm saying is from the very beginning, we this assumption is playing as a role because reducing it in reduce this uh, uh, getting it in the, in the getting the alpha in the representing alpha in the lowest for reduced form, those things make sense only when you are working in UFD. So, now in UFD reducibles are prime, so that will force P device R. So, thus you obtain a common device irreducible divisor of R and S which is a contradiction. Okay. So, therefore, as a consequence of this you obtain that. So, in a UFD if you go to this field of fractions, then the extra elements that you add, they are not going to be integral over that UFD. In particular, only rational numbers which are algebraic integers, I should add a corollary, R belongs to Q is an algebraic integer if R is in jet. R, R is in jet. Okay. Then what are the next, uh, what are, uh, so here we see that uh, at least for uh, beyond z inside q we cannot get anything, but however beyond q we, we do have several algebraic uh, integers. So the question is uh, do, uh, do we have uh, other examples? Yes, we do have, uh, in fact which is going to be perhaps the, uh, perhaps uh, one of the most important uh, uh, examples for uh, the rest of our course. So, recall that uh, G B uh, recall that for any group G and a vector space over any field F a representation of G on V is a homomorphism from G to G L V. Okay. For the rest of this course we will consider, so uh, for the rest of this course we will only consider uh, this the following that uh, the vector spaces are over C okay. and if necessary we will if even for the most of the part we will assume that G is also a finite group. So, therefore, consider a uh, consider, but however, uh, you can see that uh, whatever we are going to define that uh, that easily okay, I should also define uh, assume that this is finite. So, whatever we are going to do that is you can immediately see that it uh, like the definition that you are going to make that also holds for any repre representation over any uh, field uh, as long as the vector space of finite dimension. Okay, so, let me define the character of our representation. So, given this representation rho, so character of rho 
character of row is defined as the so for each row we have row g right so assuming v is finite dimensional row g we can talk about trace of row g how because you just take any basis of v and with respect to the basis you look look at the matrix and consider and uh, uh, consider its trace and uh, if you choose a different ordered basis but th then the matrix representations will be conjugate to each other so therefore at the level of trace it doesn't matter so therefore we define for, uh, the character uh, character chi of rho at the point g by this okay so basically simply it's the trace of it's the trace of uh, the uh, uh, corresponding uh, linear operator and that makes sense because we have under uh, assume this finite dimensionality so in our course whatever is left out we will be only considering representations over c of uh, of finite groups but however as i said in many places you you can see that the the, the definition goes through over a, over some more general setting as well okay so the claim is that uh, uh, if, you, if you take a complex finite dimensional representation of a group then the character is going to be a claim is for any g chi g is an algebraic integer algebraic integer okay why so let's try to understand why this can be even true so like uh, we uh, what are we having so, so here uh, yeah so here uh, uh, while doing its algebraic integers so simply we assume like from now on as i won't even uh, further mention that my vector space is over c okay so g is a uh, g is a group now look at rho g okay so okay as i said that uh, we will also need this when i mean for most of the parts we need this finite uh, fi this finite groups so here also for this uh, we also need that g to be finite okay so uh, let me try to argue that uh, so since g is in a finite an element of a finite group for so for some n g to the power n will be an identity now rho of g to the power n because of homomorphism it will be rho g to the power n and rho uh, and rho of uh, this identity will be identity operator on v so therefore rho g so you see that we have this property rho g equal to identity it's a on a complex vector space so that immediately shows that it has all so so it have first of all it has uh, so like uh, to the power n so it has all distinct uh, 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 eigen values okay not maybe i should say the following so so this is there so the minimal polynomial of rho g will be a will be a divisor of x to the power n minus 1 and x to the power n minus 1 has all distinct roots so therefore the minimal polynomial of rho g will have all distinct roots hence rho g is going to be diagonalizable okay so not only that what will be in the diagonal so in the matrix of rho g so in the diagonal entries we will have some roots of unity so therefore the trace of rho g will be the sum of sum and a sum of uh, sum of some of the nth roots of unity right uh, well uh, here n just a minute yeah so sum of uh, so yeah so the trace of this character is diagonalizable i think i should write here chi rho g is the sum of 
sum of uh, some roots of unity. Okay, some roots of unity, and each roots of each root of unit is an algebraic integer. So now uh, from this, it will follow that this is going to Cairo of G is going to be an algebraic integer, provided we can prove that the sum of two algebraic integers will be an algebraic integer. Because here the sum and in the sum and that appears here in the definition of Cairo G, so each sum and is an algebraic integer. So from that it will be so from that it will follow that Cairo G is also an algebraic integer, provided I can prove that the sum of two algebraic integers will be an algebraic integer. Okay. In fact, that holds in a greater generality. So, as I said that, uh, I mean let me again remind you that most, uh, for most of the uh, part of this course which is left out, I will like whenever I talk about integral dependence, I will mostly stick to integral algebraic integers that is integral dependence over z, but however, whatever doing many of them they, say, they hold in a greater generality. In fact, the verbatim repetition of the proof for algebraic integers also work there. Okay. So, let me immediately uh, draw the following uh, uh, prove the following propositions. Okay. So, as expected extension of commutative rings, extension of commutative rings and uh, suppose let alpha 1 alpha n are l are uh, integral let them let these are be integral over a let this be integral over a then we consider the smallest subring of b that contains a and these elements okay this is the smallest subring Again, smallest means in the sense of containment. Smallest subring of A. A and uh, alpha one up to alpha n, okay, or alpha n. Then, uh, then the claim is. Then the claim is. Uh, this extension is integral okay is an integral extension i will i will tell you what it means so this nothing but means that so in an extension of rings a is b if every element of b is integral over a then we call the extension is integral okay so so, what this means is every element lying here is integral over A and that is actually quite easy to see because of the following thing is that uh, if you remember that we derive we proved several other statements which are equivalent to saying an element is integral over A. So, one of those statements uh, one of them was that uh, there is a subring. So, there is a subring C that contains A alpha which is finitely generated over A. So, we see that the same happens here. Let me just uh, uh, explain that when uh, we are given only two elements. The further thing is just an immediate generalization of that. In fact, uh, by induction you can settle. So, like if alpha and beta are integral over A then A alpha beta is finitely generated over A that is what the claim is that is what the claim is is finitely generated over A. How to prove that? So, first of all like uh, if we do the write down the proof here. So, A alpha is finitely generated over A. Therefore, let these be a generating set V1, V2, Vn 
well V R which is the sorry this is the generators of A alpha over A. Similarly, we do have something like that A beta over A right. So, so then let us let us look at what is A alpha beta. What is A alpha beta? So, what was A alpha? A alpha consists of precisely all polynomial uh, polynomial expressions in the elements which can be expressed as a polynomial in alpha in loose terms right. So, then it is very natural to guess what is going to be this. So, let me give you a quick argument. So, one thing is clear that alpha beta is the smallest subring containing A alpha and beta right. This is quite clear. The smallest subring that contains both A alpha and beta the same same as the smallest subring of course of B that contains A alpha and beta and therefore, each element lying here should be a polynomial expression in beta with coefficients from A alpha and now in every coefficient A alpha, A alpha is again a every coefficient that is coming from A alpha is again a polynomial in alpha therefore, therefore all together we have all polynomial expressions with these two variables uh, with these two alpha and beta right. So, therefore, this consists of all polynomial expressions in both alpha and beta. So, now uh, let us uh, now let us uh, do the following that uh, this is uh, this is an independent observation which will be helpful sometimes. Now, let us come back to the proof of this. So, there first of all uh, first of all. So, yeah let us take a let us take a typical element typical element uh, lying here. If we consider just some monomial alpha to the power i beta to the power j right let's take a monomial here. So, yeah let us see that how we can write this. So, alpha a alpha is certainly going to be some combination of v i's ok. Uh, okay. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. So, alpha to the power i that lies in alpha to the power i this lies in A alpha right. This lies in A alpha. So, therefore, alpha to the power i is some combination of V i's V V r. Similarly, beta to the power j will lie in A beta. So, you have some combination of beta l. So, all total thus you see that this monomial is actually some combinations of this things V i W j ok. So, every such monomial in alpha and beta every such term like this is actually a combination of V i W j s. So, therefore, any finite sum of them will be again a will be again a combination of elements of the form V i W j. So, therefore, we see that and this coefficients these are all coming from A. Therefore, we see that this set actually generates A alpha beta over A for A. So, and uh, once we have done it for 2, I, I think now you know that how to do it for uh, how to do it for uh, uh, this any uh, for, for this uh, when, when we are uh, when we are uh, the considering n elements. So, the same argument goes ok, the same kind of argument, but the, here the notations will be much more cumbersome. because they are uh, like uh, in this way by inductively you can show that every element here is basically is a, a polynomial with coefficients from A and polynomial and in, in the expressions alpha on up to alpha n. So, like this each monomial can be expressed uh, as a combination of uh, pro all possible products of the generators 
Okay, the same proof goes. Since for two it will be less cumbersome to write, therefore I have written that, but the general case is clear. Anyway, so therefore once we have done this, then it has an immediate corollary. What is the corollary? The corollary is the following that if, so again my setup is this arbitrary extension, an extension of arbitrary commutative rings, if alpha beta belongs to B are integral over A, are integral over A, then so are alpha plus beta and alpha beta. Why so? Because both of them, this both A alpha plus beta and A alpha beta both are contained in this ring A alpha beta and this is, you see immediately, so this is, uh, so th this ring is contained in a subring of B which is finitely generated over A and that is exactly the condition, uh, an equivalent condition for this uh, element to be integral over A. Okay. So, since this is finitely generated over A, therefore alpha plus beta is integral over A, similarly alpha beta. Okay. And as a consequence, we see that of course, like this immediately settles this that chi g is an algebraic integer. that immediately settles this. However, this gives something more that given any extension of rings, the following x is integral over a is a subring. is a subring of B. Okay. So, given an extension of rings, I consider so, all elements in B may need not be integral over alpha. However, we consider precisely those elements in B which are integral over A and that is going to be a subring of B. So, this is called the integral closure, integral closure of A in B. Okay. So, as an example, we see that the integral closure of z inside Q is z itself or more generally the integral closure of any UFD inside its field of fractions is the UFD itself. And uh, we, since we have defined this integral closure, two more definitions are uh, relevant at this point. So, let me denote this by C for the time being. So, this is just the integral closure. So, we have two cases. So, if C is equal to A, two extreme cases because this is going to, already we have shown that any x belongs to A is trivially integral over uh, A because uh, so any alpha in A is trivially integral over A because you can consider this polynomial x minus alpha. Okay. So, this is a subring that contains A. So, this is somewhere in between A and C. So, we have two extreme cases if C is equals to A. So, that means no element. So, that means uh, the integral closure does not contain any element other than the, those of other than those of A. So, in that case we say that A is integrally closed. A is integrally closed in uh, B and in the, the other extreme C is. So, in this case we say that the extension. So, this means all elements in B are integral. So, as I have already said in this case we say A is integral over. So, uh, the, the extension is integral. See the extension is integral. Okay. 
so that this corresponds to the other extreme and uh, uh, and uh, of course here we also uh, introduce a terminology terminology so we simply say that uh, an integral domain so let a be an integral domain we say it is integrally closed integrally closed if it is integrally closed in its field of fractions. As example, if A is a UFD, then it is integrally closed, it is integrally closed, closed in its field of fractions. Okay. And what uh, next? Uh, hmm. So, also we say that B is another way of saying we, we also say that B is in this situation, B is integral over A. Okay. The next thing is the con transitivity of this integral dependence. Before that, let me simply check whether I missed something to mention or not. Uh, B is an integral over A. Hmm. Okay, so before a transitivity, huh, let me directly prove that. Uh, let me directly prove this. So, the transitivity so what it says is suppose we are having a extension of commutative rings extension of commutative rings simply like commutative rings okay assume that b is integral over a A and C is integral over B. C is integral over B. Then we are going to prove A is integral. So C is integral over A. A. So how to prove that? So take uh, take some element take some element from C, since C is integral over A B, so therefore, we will have some co polynomial like this. Okay. Recall that all this B 0 up to B n minus 1 all are integral over A because B is integral over A. So, therefore, we see that we see the following that uh, alpha is integral over this ring A B0 B1 B n minus 1. Okay. So, this is clear from here. Uh, like uh, because uh, the polynomial that we obtain that polynomial can be immediately regarded as a polynomial here right so alpha is integral over this now uh, our task is to show that uh, uh, alpha is in fact integral over c so uh, how to do that alpha is integral over a and then uh, 
alpha is integral over uh, okay so one thing is clear that this is finitely generated over a this is finitely generated over a and uh, ah and of course ah, this good this is finitely generated over a and uh, furthermore this is also a quite interesting thing that a b n minus 1 alpha is is finitely generated over this ring right because we see that this is integral over this ring so therefore therefore with this ring when we join one more element alpha so this is going to be finitely generated over this so now the situation is the following which exactly looks like the previous one so the situation is the following that uh, well if we use different notations let us say p r and q suppose these are commutative rings not rationals any q. So if r is finitely generated over p and q is finitely generated over r so r is finitely so this you can put as a general proposition in fact the same idea we have used earlier r is finitely generated over p and q is finitely generated over r then that will force q is finitely generated over p the procedure the way to prove is exactly similar to what we have done earlier okay in fact uh, you can also use that uh, like uh, we use that in the earlier case we considered the fact that they are actually looks uh, like polynomial expressions but if instead of getting into the you can also prove by this so how to prove it here so therefore since q is finitely generated over r let a generator of this be w1 up to wl and here uh, take a generator to be v1 up to vr so therefore any element in r can be written as a combination of w1 to wl but here the coefficients are from r right now each of these coefficients can be written as a combination of v1 v2 vr v1 v2 vr right each of these coefficients so all total things are expressible by this collections v i w j okay so that shows this now how to use that in the previous case so if alpha and beta are integral over f then you can immediately consider in, in the spirit of this that beta is integral over a alpha okay beta is integral over a alpha and uh, so therefore a alpha beta is finitely generated over a alpha and a alpha is finitely generated over a so therefore using this okay you will have to end. So you see the same kind of argument is being repeated so uh, maybe instead of ignoring uh, maybe instead of looking at the elements of a alpha beta as polynomials you can directly use this uh, general this general proposition anyway. So here now it is of course fine right because uh, this is because this is uh, 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 this is uh, simply what I would say so this is finitely generated over this and this is certainly finitely generated over a because in succession you can go that a to a b naught from a b naught to a b naught b1 and every stage you have like uh, again let me give you the details what I exactly mean by this so this you can write as follows a a b not then a b not b1 so on and so forth okay so each bi is finitely generated over each b is finitely generated over a so therefore this is finitely generated this is finitely generated over a now like when we adjoin b1 here 
certainly b1 is going to be integral over this ring. So therefore, this is this is also finitely generated over this and in succession it goes on. That shows this is finitely generated over A and this is finitely generated over this ring. So from uh, this transitivity, it follows that this is finitely generated over, over A. So thus you see you have an subring of B, you have a subring of this C which is which contains A and which is finitely generated over A and that contains alpha. So therefore that forces alpha to be integral. So this holds for any alpha in C. Okay. So this is a very kind of typical uh, uh, argument that you see. Basically the same argument here is being repeated in different uh, ways perhaps. Anyway, so it is uh, therefore this is uh, done the integrability of this and this has an immediate corollary. What is the corollary? It says that suppose these are uh, extension of rings, so an extension of commutative rings. and C is the integral closure of A in B, okay. Then then uh, is the integral closure then uh, B is integral. Huh. So, yeah. so then C is integrally closed, integrally closed this is an immediate corollary if because if something is so like uh, we take the integral closure of C inside B, okay. So let us call it C dash. So therefore C dash, so the integral closure of C, of course the C dash will be integral over C by definition and A is and C is integral over A because this is the integral closure of A. Therefore, so C prime is integral over C, C is integral over A. So therefore C prime will be integral over A. So every element of C prime is going to be integral over A. Now precisely that is what the definition of C is. So that forces, so uh, the proof will be simply, if you want to write down the proof. So the proof here. What is this? So let C prime. be the integral closure of integral closure of C in B okay. So that forces C is integral over C furthermore one has C is also integral over A. A. So, these two will immediate force C prime is integral over A in view of the previous transitivity. But that is from the definition of C, C has to be equal to C prime. Okay. So, once you take an integral closure, once you take the integral closure in an extension then whatever you obtain that is going to be integrally closed in the bigger ring. That is what we see from view of the transitivity. Okay. Now let me make sure that I have not missed anything. Integral. Yeah. So,
Okay. So, I think uh, uh, this is uh, quite, uh, this is uh, good enough for uh, the discussion of uh, uh, extension, uh, for the dis discussion on integral dependence. More uh, on integral dependence, you will come to know if we will pursue some, st if, you, if you pursue uh, some uh, commutative algebra, because uh, these things are the topics which are primarily discussed there. We just we just uh, discuss, I mean, we just, uh, uh, I mean, uh, talked about uh, the primary definitions and uh, some of the basic facts because we are going to need that in what we are going to do in the rest uh, of uh, this course. Uh, okay, so before I move on to some other topic, let me tell you that mostly we have tried to develop things in the general scenario as much as we can. Regarding the examples, like uh, as we say, for our purpose, it will be enough to stick to only algebraic integers. But of course, uh, there are a lot more examples beyond the beyond the setting of Z, Q, R, or C. So as I said, that if you pursue, if you do some course in commutative algebra, you will come to know more and more examples of this integral dependence. Okay. So I think uh, it's uh, good enough. Uh, now I should now I should move uh, to extension of fields. So again, that uh, like uh, we are uh, doing this not to study field extensions in the generality, and not even uh, we don't have not even we are going to study uh, that uh, extensively. So, we simply need some of the basic facts from this extension of rings and uh, fields in the representation theory that we are going to do subsequently. So, therefore, we are just uh, uh, like uh, talking about some of uh, those basic facts. So, these are basically the uh, like we, we are uh, preparing ourselves to uh, preparing ourselves to uh, and for the near future. Okay. So, the, the uh, extension of fields that has quite similar to that of extension of rings. In fact, you can immediately say that the extension of rings must be a generalization of field extensions. So, this indeed the case. I will show you the similarities as well. Suppose K and L are fields. Our fields, and uh, we say that K L is an extension of K if L is contained inside K. So, like so, this is a, uh, I mean, this is a general setup, and the, and that is a restrictive one. So, therefore, of course, we can talk about elements which are integral over K in this setup. So, they here they have a special name. So, alpha is L is uh, said to be said to be algebraic over over k if the same thing there exist f x in so if there exist uh, f x in uh, uh, k x so which will have alpha as a root. So, here it is not so serious to consider that is monic because uh, constants are always units. So, it is enough to say that the degree f is at least 1 such that f alpha is 0. Again, let me repeat that it here it is actually not necessary to insist that f has to be monic because uh, constants are non-zero constants are always unit. So, whenever you have a non, uh, whenever you have such a polynomial, non-constant polynomial, we can simply divide its coefficients by uh, the leading coefficient uh, that will lead you to something which is monic. Okay. So, if you say it to be algebraic over k, if there exists a pol non-constant polynomial which has alpha as a root and as you see that remark, we can take remark, we can take f to be monic. So, of course, this is a special case of integral dependence. We can take f to be monic. 
In fact, the interesting part here is here we can even take f to be irreducible, okay, which is not clear here, which is no, which need not be the case in case of generating and extensions. That's precisely because of the following observation that this f admits a factorization like f can be written as a product of irreducible polynomials, right? So, therefore, uh, f can be written as f1 of 2 fk, each fi is irreducible, of course, belonging to kx, okay. So, since if f of alpha is 0, then 1 of this fi's must be 0, okay. So, therefore, we can even take this to be irreducible, monic and in fact irreducible irreducible okay and furthermore if we insist these two conditions monic and irreducible then for any given alpha this f is going to be unique that is actually quite clear so why is that clear let me tell you, there are several ways to uh, say that. So, one way of showing this is by means of this homomorphism, which will be uh, important for us for later on. So, from k x to from k x to l. So, try to see. So, from k to l, we have a natural inclusion and therefore, we do have um, a homomorphism from k x to l. So, extension of this map sending x to alpha. Okay. So, basically, we in send any phi x to phi alpha. So, thus you see that by definition the image is going to be k of alpha image is simply k of alpha is on to inside L because k of alpha is by definition uh, from the definition it is clear. Now, uh, the thing is that uh, the uh, if alpha is algebraic assume that alpha is algebraic over assume that alpha is algebraic over k. So, assume alpha is algebraic. So, I mean this holds for any alpha for that you do not need anything to be algebraic. Now, if in this I mean now if you assume that alpha is algebraic, algebraic over k then so then we see that we do have a irreducible polynomial, irreducible polynomial which is uh, which is having alpha root and also we have already said that when as soon as we have some irreducible polynomial having alpha as a root, you can make this polynomial monic. So, therefore, we have an in the kernel. So, this kernel is of course, a principal ideal okay, because this is a PID. So, this kernel of this map is a principal ideal right, it is a principal ideal that is quite clear. Uh, now, what is going to happen principal ideal because it is a PID and also we have seen that the principal ideal contains a contains a irreducible element right. So, if a principal ideal contains an irreducible element it has to be the generator of that ideal because the principal ideal irreducible element does not have any proper factorization. So, it has to have a, it, uh, this irreducible element has to be a generator of that and not only that furthermore in PID the irreducible elements they only generate the maximal ideals. Hence, this quotient is going to be a field that ensures that k alpha is also going to be a field. So, let let f be an irreducible polynomial such that such that f of alpha is 0. So, here I should say over k x. Okay. Then this i, i has to be generated by f and consequently we obtain k x 
के अल्फा सो रिमेम्बर दैट इन अ जेनरल सिनेरियो के अल्फा इज जस्ट ओनली अ रिंग दैट कंटेन्स के एन अल्फा बट नाउ इट फर्दर एश्योर्स दैट के अल्फा इज नॉट ओनली रिंग इट हैज टू बी अ फील्ड एज वेल ओके एंड like also from here it is clear that as i was talking about that uh, this f uh, so if we insist f to be monic so now i should say here if the previous if uh, this f is monic then it is unique why so this is very simple that uh, uh, like uh, if there is another let's say g another irreducible monic polynomial which has also alpha as a root then g will be inside the kernel therefore f will be dividing g but then you see that f and g are both irreducibles so they are can only be associates to each other that is constant multiples of each other but since we have assumed both of them are monic so there is no choice other for g other than f so there's a very clear cut argument so yeah therefore we, thus whatever we have seen is if alpha is algebraic then there is a unique monic polynomial which over k which is having alpha as a root and for that polynomial so if we take that polynomial or of course any constant multiple of that then we are going to have this isomorphism okay so here i will just simply introduce another notation so in case of in case of fields like uh, of course if beta is in l then like earlier you can say the constant uh, earlier you can say that the smallest sub field of l smallest sub ring of l containing k and alpha that will be denoted by k beta which we have already introduced for any general extension of rings but he, since here you are working with fields you can also ask for the smallest sub field of smallest sub field of l the l that contains both k and beta and that sub field is denoted by k beta it is clear that this will be k k round square bracket beta will be contained in set k round bracket beta so let me simply write smallest sub field smallest sub field of k l containing k and beta so in general we have this inclusion if alpha is if the given element is algebraic then for, uh, since this then from that it is clear that we will have the equality because this becomes a field okay from the smallest since is the smallest one they have to be equal all right and also another point to be noted here that this homomorphism sends the sends the x bar that is the coset of x to alpha which is here clear from clear from this anyway okay so this is what we obtain uh, when an element uh, when in an extension of fields an element is algebraic over the bottom field so let me again tell you the difference that uh, earlier in this con in the context of integral dependence over it for any extension of commutative rings Uh, we could only say that we have a mon when we just said we have a monic polynomial we cannot further insist that this is irreducible or it is in unique anything like that but in case of field extensions we can really do that that's what it uh, shows and furthermore the quotient so this uh, the smallest sub ring in this situation k alpha that becomes a field okay i will just introduce uh, one more thing and with that i will just state and then i will finish okay so if you remember that we developed certain statements which are equivalent to saying uh, some element is integral over the bottom ring in the extension so we should expect they are analogs to happen in this scenario as well in fact we do have so let this be an extension of fields so the uh, what what should be equivalent statements the following are equivalent we'll prove them uh, maybe in the next lecture first let me try to formulate them 
So, alpha in L is algebraic over K, K. Similarly, what should be there? So, like earlier, what was the second condition in case of integral extension? So, we consider K alpha. K alpha earlier this ring was finitely generated over the ring A, but now we are working with fields. So, K alpha can now be regarded as a vector space over K. So, this finitely generated thing in terms of vector space when it translates to, it is exactly saying that this vector space regarded over the field K has dimension finite. The third condition should be, there should be a, so in, a, in, in an extension of fields, let us say small k over capital K or E over F, let me just introduce a notation. Suppose these are fields. So, if dimension of f when regarded as a vector space over k is finite, then we say it is a finite degree extension or it is a finite extension and the degree of the extension denoted by E is nothing but this dimension. Okay. So, this is the general thing we can say. Of course, for rings we cannot say dimensions unless uh, I mean uh, at the most if things are free modules then we can perhaps say for, for the rank, but again I do not want to get into that. So, the third equivalent condition would be there exists a finite extension the finite extension let us say E of L E of K in L uh, containing alpha containing alpha and the fourth one is regarding determinant which I am uh, not writing because you know what uh, you know how to formulate and then prove and the proof of this equivalence are also uh, again almost in the similar line. For example, like uh, maybe I will just uh, say a few words not the detailed proof. Uh, recall that uh, in case of ring extensions, so what was the generators of uh, what was the generators of A alpha? So, these were just 1 up to alpha to the power n minus 1 when the minimal, minimal polynomial has degree n, when that uh, this polynomial is having degree n. So, here what we will do is we consider the minimal polynomial. Okay. So, this f is called the minimal polynomial of alpha. Remember for note that for general arbitrary extension of rings, we cannot say anything, any polynomial having that property minimal and denoted by f alpha. Okay. So, 1 to 2 is again in the same line, take the minimal polynomial and uh, you can then show that uh, if, if n is the degree of f alpha then 1 alpha alpha to the power n is a basis. So, uh, so 2 to 3 is again further. So, 1 to 2, 2 to 3 is also immediate and then okay, th th I think for today I am uh, like I have already running out of time. So, maybe today I will stop. So, tomorrow, so in the next lecture we will first, uh, maybe we will first give a proof of this or we can also leave it as an, maybe we will first give a proof of this and do and uh, then talk about some things uh, from the, uh, from the extension, yeah, talk about some more about extension of fields. Okay. So, with that I stop this lecture.